Colleagues, welcome back to the office and welcome to our presentation and podcast for today. This is New Spreadsheet Tips and Tricks. My name is Steve Yoss. You're in my office. We're here to learn today about some of the incredible and compelling technologies that are coming up with respect to Microsoft Excel. Some of the incredible tools, techniques, and services, features, and functions of this application. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's constantly changing. Every year, there are new features and functions that are coming out with this incredible application. And if we don't pay attention, you know, we're going to get left behind. And frankly, you know, there are so many new things that have been added recently that really can improve our productivity and workflow. And in our series today and in our presentation, what we're looking at is essentially everything I think you should know how to do to really kind of leverage this incredible tool effectively. So we're going to take a look today and we're going to be examining several different functions inside of this application. Uh, in the first part of our presentation today, we're going to go ahead and look at the data types features of Excel. Uh, data types at the moment are limited to geography and stocks, but what we can use these tools for is pulling dynamic real-time information from uh, online sources from Microsoft regarding financial instruments like you know the current price of the Delta stock or the Microsoft stock or the Apple stock. And also being able to pull real-time information related to geography. Uh, so if I want to pull, for example, information about states, countries, and more, uh, I can go ahead and use this data type function. Next, we're going to take a look at some new Excel formulas that I think you should know about, including XLOOKUP, uh, which is the newest method and manner of being able to look up uh, data inside of Excel. Uh, it's far superior to its counterparts VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP and comparable to index and match. Uh, in a lot of ways, index and match is a complicated formula that a lot of people have struggles with, and VLOOKUP is quite limited and slow. XLOOKUP is the best of both worlds. And so we're going to understand what and how those features uh, and functions work. We're also going to take a look at dynamic arrays. Uh, one cell to rule them all, if you will. A dynamic array is the ability to write a formula and then have it spill into other aspects and characteristics of uh, the spreadsheet. And so you can write your formula in one central place and have it affect multiple other places inside the application. Uh, then we're going to go ahead and take a look at the analyze data feature inside of Excel, uh, which allows us to essentially ask questions to our data and have it, uh, you know, provide information back to us. Uh, we can ask it real time questions. We can ask it uh, to produce charts, graphs, pivots, and more from our data. It's a really interesting and useful way to be able to analyze our data effectively inside of Excel. Now, in the second part of our class, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at Flash Fill, uh, which is a pattern recognition tool inside of Excel uh, that's really compelling because it allows us to be able to automatically sense a pattern, uh, for example, like splitting up a GL account number or an address and, and have it continue that pattern throughout our worksheet. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at real-time collaboration, which is a 365 uh, and Microsoft Teams feature and SharePoint feature that allows us to be able to instantly share and collaborate on documents with our colleagues uh, in real time uh, without the need of ever having to share or um, send a document by email again. It's my preferred way of being able to work on documents with my staff. And we're going to take a deep dive into Microsoft Power Query and next generation Excel reporting. Uh, this is a combination of several different features and functions inside of Excel, uh, all centralized around Power Query. Um, for those of you who might be familiar with the old name, it was Get and Transform. But Power Query is a revolutionary way of being able to grab and extract data from Excel. Uh, and it allows you to essentially hook your Excel workbook up to virtually any data source inside of uh, as long as it's structured. So it could be on a network drive, it could be on the web, it could be on a REST API, you name it. Um, there's been almost no projects I have not been able to leverage Power Query effectively to be able to pull and extract data uh, from there automatically. It's a really revolutionary tool and I'm really excited to be able to show you how this feature works. All that and more in terms of what we are going to discuss and review today.
Now, for those of you who have not had a class with me before, again, my name is Steve Yoss. I am an instructor with K2 and with CPE Today. Uh, my career and experience is kind of split right down the middle. I spent half my time working and uh, developing software for my clients, and I spent about half my time teaching and instructing education and technology topics for financial professionals. Uh, so if you have any questions, you're welcome to uh, reach out uh, and uh, check out my website, steveyoss.com. And as part of my work and practice here, uh, I produce all different types of technology, uh, software for my clients, as well as uh, courses and topics. So if there's something I can help you with, I'd be more than happy to do so. Now, as a reminder, we have our podcast. Our podcast comes out twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific. You can watch live and earn CPE credits for watching live. And if you can't join us when the podcast is being produced and watching live, you can always download it for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and so much more. And in fact, for watching our podcast, you can earn credits for watching or listening. If you attend live, you can just attend, get polling questions. But if you are uh, watching after the fact, you know, all you have to do is head on over to cpetoday.com and use our course code, which is NTT1 for the first part of our class and NTT2 for the second part of our class. You'll take a short five question quiz and you will earn a credit for watching or listening. Uh, in addition to your purchase, you'll also get a copy of the presentation. You can ask me questions, uh, and you'll also get copies of the sample files. We're going to spend most of our day in, in Excel today, so you can follow along by doing the actual samples yourself. Now, if you're a new watcher or listener to the podcast, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so happy to have you here. Um, how about you get a free credit on us? You can pick any podcast if you're choosing and use coupon code one free podcast at checkout and you can get today's class or any other class of your choosing completely for free. All right, folks, without further ado, let's go ahead and kick this off and get started for today. Alrighty, so we're going to start our journey today with the data types feature and function of Excel. And with this, it allows us to be able to get stock and geography data all inside of Excel automatically. And it's coming directly from uh, an online source, which is somewhere buried deep inside Microsoft. And it's as easy as really just kind of starting to type something inside of Excel. You convert it into a table, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And then you would select what data type you would like, either the stock data type or the geography data type. Now, these are the two types that are currently being supported. Uh, it allows you to be able to pull financial information if it's related to a stock. If it is related to geography, you use the geotype and it'll pull down data like GDP or uh, consumer price index or demographic information and more. Microsoft has big plans for this, and depending on your version of Excel uh, and what 365 plan you have available, uh, you might even see more of these popping up here in the near future. Uh, in particular, one that's really interesting is that you can actually hook up your Power BI featured data sets to Excel and be able to extract information directly from there as well. Although that feature is still in limited release, so we're not going to discuss it today, but we are going to discuss the two main ones that are currently present. But again, be on the lookout. There are more of these data types uh, coming. Now, let's go ahead. And now, we're going to start our day with taking a look at the geography data type. And then we're going to go ahead and switch over to stocks. Now, before I get going, there's two things I want to point out with respect to this. Uh, the first, this is a 365 only subscriber feature. Uh, as of many of the things that we're going to talk about today, a lot of them are going to be 365 only. Uh, so if you don't have a 365 plan, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to do much of the new stuff going forward. Microsoft has really feature limited uh, the standalone perpetual license of uh, Excel and the rest of the Office ecosystem. For the most part, a lot of these now are going to be 365 features. They really are pushing you over. If you're not familiar with 365, um, just Google Microsoft 365 and you can find out there's lots of different plans from home to small business to enterprise. And you might actually already have it. If you're not familiar what version of Excel you have, come on over here to the file menu inside of Excel. Drop down here to account from the file menu. Okay, so over here in the far left. And you'll see here 
once the, the the account menu pops up, it'll tell you how you got this product. So you can see here, this is a subscription. So it is a 365 subscription. We can see it's 365 for enterprise. Uh, and that just tells me I've got access to all the 365 stuff, which is really going to be helpful for things like using the XLOOKUP function or real-time collaboration and more. Okay. One last thing, as long as you're on this screen, that's useful to know. If you hover over the About Excel, this will tell you two really important things. It'll tell you the version of Excel you're currently on, as well as what update path you are using. So we can see here I'm using version 2203. So 2022 is the year. March is the uh, is the month. Uh, so we can see that this is relatively up to date and we can see the exact build, which might be helpful, especially if you're looking at bugs and you run into an issue. Usually it'll say, hey, this bug affects what specific build. And then below it, you'll see it says current channel, which indicates that that uh, I am on roughly uh, the update path that will update monthly thereabouts. There's like five or six different upgrade channels. Uh, I recommend that you stay at either no more recent than the current to avoid any sort of unforeseen bugs or issues. So that's issue number one I wanted you to be aware of. And I'll do my best as we get through this presentation to point out what's a 365 subscriber feature and what, what is not. Now, the next thing is tables, okay? Tables are a defined object inside of Excel. Now you might look at an Excel spreadsheet and you say, hey, Steve, this looks like a table to begin with. There are columns, there are rows. How is this not a table? Well, it's not. A table is something that you add to your data set. And I could go on the virtues of tables all throughout the day, and I, I probably will spread in a fair amount of this knowledge, but I'll keep it concise. And it's something that you're gonna add and it allows you to treat the selection of cells you have as an object inside the spreadsheet. And uh, in doing so, there's lots of features and powers and benefits, and a lot of these newer compelling features inside of Excel are going to be predicated that you use a, a table, okay? Now, the table can be added lots of different ways. Uh, we can come over here, smack dab in the home section and select this option here that says format as a table. Uh, if we come over here to the insert ribbon, and on the far left side next to our pivot table feature, you'll see table listed here. Or you could use the shortcut control T. Uh, what you want to do before making the table, ensure that you have a header. Ensure that your data is contiguous, all touching each other. Avoid completely blank rows or columns. And just go ahead and create that table. And in doing so, it'll pop up a little menu here that'll say, hey, you want to create a table? You're going to say yes. Okay. We're going to indicate that our table has headers. And in doing so, Alakazam, we now have our table. And it's going to make our, our when we go to create other things, uh, much faster and simpler uh, because tables have this really nifty ability to self-replicate. Now that we've got this listed, we're going to go ahead and highlight our cities here. And we're going to access our geo data type from the data ribbon. And from the data ribbon, smack dab here in the middle, you'll see data types. Uh, listed, and you'll see both the geo data type as well as the um, stocks data type. So, what we're going to go ahead and choose here is going to be the geo data type to get started with. And you'll know that you've converted this into the geography data type because it'll create this little nifty map looking icon here. Okay, now the geography data type will work at a country level, at a state level, at a county level, and then also at a city level. But the amount of information will vary. And you know, the smaller of the geo that you're working with, the less information available. And certain things just don't find out unless it is a big uh, geo. You know, certain things like the consumer price index or the price of gasoline or certain demographic information, we only collect that at census level uh, areas and we might not have it super small. But looking here at the city level, let's say for New Orleans, we can see here certain information about it. We can see where it's located. So at the state level, we can see it's in Louisiana, it's in the United States. Here's the mayor, the population, the area, the latitude, the longitude, so on and so forth. I also want to point out that we're looking at mixed geos in the sense that we've got both uh, cities in the United States as well as in Canada. Okay. So if we wanted to start adding information about these things, you'll notice once we put our active cell on the geo, in this case the city, we get this special look at icon that pops up in the upper right hand corner. Okay, and this allows us to add columns. 
So we can go ahead and, for example, and add maybe the state or province level. And we'll see it creates a new column specifically for that area. And this is a relatively new feature. If it is another uh, known geotype, for example, the state of California here, it'll even create that geo for you uh, automatically. Okay, and what it's really kind of cool about this is it allows us to be able to go through and add additional columns that could be useful for our report and for our analysis. So if we wanted to, for example, to add the latitude, the longitude, maybe do some geo um, understanding, we could go ahead and do so. We can go ahead and hit population here. We'll see here the population of these cities. Uh, and I want to point out sometimes, for example, you're going to get things where it won't pop up. Uh, because it won't necessarily be known or it's an, an invalid component of that particular place. And you're going to get an error. Okay, so let me just grab another one over here. Notice, for example, we added the second administrative division. Okay, and so the administration division here is the county or district. Uh, and you'll notice that we got this pound field error. Okay, well, the reason we got that is because, well, in the state of uh, Louisiana, New Orleans has parishes, which are like counties, but I guess not supported here. And in Halifax, uh, which is in Nova Scotia, which is in Canada, well, I guess they don't have a second administrative division. So if you get that pound field, just know that it is, it just doesn't have that information. It's not a, a real error in the sense that you did a calculation issue problem. It just doesn't have that information present. Let's go ahead and take a look at our country one. So let's go ahead and add a new second record. So we'll do country. We're going to do USA. We'll do Canada. Uh, let's go ahead and do Mexico. Let's do uh, the UK and let's do Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand is for all my listeners here for the CPE Today podcast. You know, I have a soft spot in my heart for the beautiful country of New Zealand, a place I lived for a bit. OK, same thing as before. We're going to go ahead and turn this into a table. Once it's turned into a table from the data menu, we're going to go ahead and select the geography data type. And you'll see it instantly turns in to that geo data type. Lots more options present here for the country level. So agricultural land by percent, armed forces size, uh, the consumer price index, the country code, the fertility rate, the forest area, uh, the largest city, the leaders, the minimum wage, the national anthem, physicians per thousand, population, so on and so forth. Uh, so we end up getting a lot of information with respect to each of these places. And so if we wanted to maybe analyze where to put our next office and we're going to figure out what country, well, maybe we use that geo data type to figure that out. Let's switch over and take a look at the stocks geotype. OK. Now, same thing as before, I've got a listing of my stocks here. We're going to go ahead and turn this into a table by hitting control T. And we're going to go ahead and indicate that our table does, in fact, have headers. There we go. We're going to go ahead and select our stocks here. And from our data tab, we're going to go ahead and select the stocks type. And just like before, when it recognizes a specific stock type, it will extend what was listed and will tell you, you know, the full name of that particular place. And also has a nifty little icon, which I can only assume is supposed to be a stock trader building. Um, and so from here, we could see that, for example, for each of these places, uh, we can see the full name of the company. So in this case, Boeing, we can see the exchange, in this case, the New York Stock Exchange, and then also the symbols that go along with each of those items. OK. So what we can do here is just like with before, we can, for example, highlight over the little stock symbol looking thing. We get the corporate name. We get the current price. Uh, it'll indicate to you, for example, for each of these uh, how recent that information is. And I'm trying to zoom in here. Come on. Nope. I guess it won't do me or let me zoom in on this. But what we could see here is we could see some information about Boeing. We could see the price change, the high, the low, the 52 week high, the 52 week low, the beta, shares outstanding, market cap, and so on and so forth. And so if we wanted to, for example, go grab and get, for example, our price, okay, we can go ahead and do so. Now, what I would potentially use this for is maybe to create some sort of uh, fair market value calculator for my stock portfolio. I might have a column over here that says quantity, and let's just go ahead and put in some information here. 
okay and i'm just randomly making up numbers here but let's just say this is my quantity of these particular uh stocks okay and then we could have another column over here we'll call this one fair market value and one of the cool things with tables is that doing uh, arithmetic or formula calculations inside tables is super simple instead of saying c2 times b2 which we would normally do using cellular reference one of the cool things is i can say hey take the current row quantity times the current row price, okay? And instead of having to remember what the heck is in column B or C, I'm actually reading the name of that particular column, in this case, quantity and price. So it makes writing formulas really easy. Now I wanna point out this is not a, um, this is not a data type thing. This is a function of tables. So this is its own thing. Okay. The other cool function with tables is they will auto replicate formulas. So it doesn't matter where I write my formula in the column of a table, it will complete that for me. So watch what happens here when I hit enter, it's going to complete that column and replicate that formula for me throughout the whole thing. Last cool thing with tables, let's say we wanted to get a total down here. Well, normally we would either write a sum formula and sum up, for example, or if we're really nifty, we would come over here to the home tab and then choose this option that says auto sum. You don't have to do that with tables, which is nice. You come on over here to table design, and from the table design, you choose total row, and look at that, it'll go ahead and add that total row for you. And I'd love to tell you all that that is my current stock portfolio, but unfortunately it's not, so I guess I'm gonna have to keep teaching here for a little bit. Um, but this is maybe one of the cool ways that you could use this stock data type, and this will auto update for you. It's just gonna update as new information is made available, you'll see these numbers changed. Now, the other cool thing that you can do with this is if we add an additional row, one of the other really cool things with tables is as tables grow, whatever information or work was done previously will grow with them. So let's add a couple other stocks here. Maybe we add AMD, maybe we add uh, Twitter, okay? Uh, maybe we add Netflix, which is unfortunately taking a beating right now. Okay, and we'll see that for our price column, it continued down. Okay, so if we add a couple more shares here, we'll see that even those formulas replicated. So the stock type, the geotype, I mean, they're awesome. They can pull that real-time information for you automatically. And then that combined with tables, I think just really kind of make it a compelling feature to consider. All right, folks, let's go ahead and have a review question and then we will move on to our next featuring function of Excel. Alrighty, so here is our first review question of the day. Why are stock and geography data types considered linked data types? So why are they there? Okay, uh, they are linked to online screen scrapes. Nope. This data is coming in not through a screen scrape, although I'm going to show you a way of doing screen scrapes using Power Query later on in our presentation here. Uh, they are linked to other tabs. Nope, that is not the case. Uh, they are considered linked data types because they are linked to an online data source and that data is coming in dynamically. So pretty nifty with respect to what you can use these things for. And I personally think they're a really compelling feature and function to consider uh, inside. And I'm really excited with respect to where this future technology is gonna go for uh, Excel. I, I've seen, for example, in some of the preview editions of Excel, they're going to be adding data types from Wolfram Alpha, uh, which is an online knowledge computational engine, which opens up a whole wealth of opportunities with respect to what you can use these data types for. So stay tuned. There's much, much more coming in. This is just the start with respect to where we're going to be able to leverage this incredible tool. Alrighty, so in our next feature that we're gonna take a look at, this is going to be dynamic arrays. Now, bear with me here, this is definitely a little bit more uh, complicated of a subject to consider talking through, uh, just basically to get the, the gist of how and where you would use this tool, okay? Now, with respect to dynamic arrays, these are a feature that have been, been building inside of Excel for a long time. If you've ever used, for example, the sum product function or the traditional way of doing array functions, well, guess what? You're already kind of on the same, on the same page because, I mean, it's roughly the same feature. Uh, dynamic arrays, though, make using arrays inside of Excel much simpler than before. 
Now, if you're looking at me and saying, Steve, what the heck is an array? I don't even know what you're talking about here. You're speaking Greek. Well, arrays are roughly a collection of cells. That's probably the best way of thinking about it. Um, you know, And when we work with an array, we're not working with one cell, but we're actually working with many cells. And an array formula is a formula that can perform multiple calculations or lookups or sorting or uniqueness or a whole bunch of different things inside of uh, a selection of cells. And so in a nutshell, we can do something in one cell and have it affect other cells around it. So there are a lot of really kind of cool uh, functions and features with respect to arrays that have been added in the recent years that are really kind of useful to kind of think about. And so you should just think of them as a collection of rows and values, a combination of different values presented in there. And with an array formula, you can return one value or multiple values from a single formula. Now, recently, they have released new functions, okay? Uh, they've released the sort function, they've released the sequence function, the unique function, the filter function, the stock history function, and more. Um, we're gonna take a look at a couple of these here right now. And in a nutshell, what this allows me to be able to do is it allows me to write a formula, for example, to sort my data and then return it back to a new range of cells or to extract a, a set of unique values um, from my data and be able to present those values back to Excel or to filter a, a set of data and then return those values to Excel. But I write one formula and can do a lot of things inside of, uh, inside of Excel, inside of my worksheets. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of different ways that we can leverage these incredible, incredible tools. All righty. Now we're in our second example file here and we're going to take a look at a couple of these that i think are useful and then i'm also going to share some knowledge with respect to some future changes that are probably going to come and some new features that are uh, functions that are going to come with respect to arrays as well but let's get started and just take a look at uh, an example of a simple table so we've got a simple table here with uh, some let's just call it check information expense information so on and so forth and we're just going to do some simple examples to help you understand some of the main features of arrays. Now, the first thing is that this table um, is, again, a defined table. Uh, if you don't know the name of the table that you're working with, a dead giveaway is to come on over here to the table design uh, ribbon tab. And from here on the left-hand side, we can see that we have the table name of payments. Uh, you know, it's not 100% the same, but when you're working with table data, by design, it's almost always an array uh, because a table is an object and an object is a collection of rows and columns. Well, guess what? That's very, very similar to an array. And so generally using tables in arrays kind of go hand in hand with each other. But let me show you some of the cool things you can do when your data is stored in a table that you can do with an array. Okay. So, um, you're always going to want to know the name of the table, the name of the columns, okay? And what you can do with this, which is pretty nifty, is I can come on over here and to cell, let's say, uh, F2 here, and I can type in the word payments, payment, as an example. And you'll notice as I start to work, type that word in here, it'll start to autocomplete. We can actually see the word payments pop up. And if we click this, you'll see that it highlights all those cells, okay? And if I hit enter here, which is kind of cool, you'll see that it creates a new range of our data in cell F2 that is that is essentially everything inside of that table. And you'll notice there's this blue border around it that is, again, a dead giveaway that you're working with an array. But notice I wrote a formula in one place. I wrote that formula in F2, but yet it is all across the actual spreadsheet itself and it's equivalent to this whole thing. And that's an array. I wrote a formula in one place and that formula now appears everywhere. So arrays need a lot of room to grow and expand, very similar to pivot tables. Uh, if you've got data, for example, and it is um, it can conflict to where the array needs to go, if I put like a one here, an error that you should be familiar with is the spill. 
Uh, and the spill will basically say, hey, what you're asking me to do here, you know, this area isn't blank. I can't work with this. Uh, all you have to do is click this obstructing cells option, delete it, and your array will work. Now, that's pulling a whole data uh, table. We could pull just specific pieces of this out, too, which is pretty nifty. We can come over here and do equals payments, and we can use an open bracket, and we can grab just pieces of this table. So just the current row, the specific columns, so the data, the vendor, the account, the amount. We can get all of it. We can get just the data component. We can just get the headers. We can just get the total rows. Um, again, these are functions of a table more than the dynamic array, but you're going to see as we start to use the sort, the filter, and some of these other functions, how useful um, knowing how to work with a table can be. Uh, so as an example, if I wanted to just pull one column here, let's just say our vendor column. Okay, well, that's just a listing of our vendors here. Or if we did equals payments, which is the name of that table, and we chose accounts, likewise, we can just go ahead and get just that one column. So knowing how to work with tables and reference them through formulas, super useful. You'll find that you use that quite often. So let's start off first with taking a look at the unique. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the unique dynamic array formula. So same thing, we've got a listing over here and uh, our table name, because I've got these set up in separate worksheets. This specific one is unique data. Um, so that's gonna be the name of the table that we're working with. Now, let's say I wanted to get a unique listing of the vendors that we are working with. Now, getting a unique listing inside of Excel, I can think of three ways just off the top of my head, okay? And that doesn't include, for example, using macros, VBA functions, or anything else like that. So let's just say I wanted, I'll show you the, the summary of how you could potentially get a unique listing. Uh, one way, for example, you can come on over here. Okay, and then we'll come on over here and we will paste this. We'll paste values as an example. One way that we could do this, we'll come over here to our data tab and we'll choose remove duplicates. Okay, so that's a one way to get a unique listing. So nine duplicate values were found, nine unique values remain. That's a destructive way, okay? And you'll also notice that we have to copy our data somewhere else. Uh, another way that we could do this is if we came over here to the Home tab, Conditional Formatting, and from Conditional Formatting under Highlight Cell Rules, we could choose Duplicate Values. Again, this will highlight uh, and show you with a specific color where duplicate values exist. So that's way number two. Uh, and another way is you can actually come on over here to the data tab, select the advanced under sort and filter. And you can, for example, point it to a specific list like this, and then choose this option that says unique records only. And in doing so, it will filter down that list to only show you unique records. Um, so lots of different ways that we can get things out, but you'll notice none of them support using a formula. All of them are functionalities of Excel, things I click on, not formulas I write. Well, guess what? Now we have our dynamic array. Now to use that dynamic array, we're gonna write the formula of unique. And it's a really simple formula to be able to write. And I will tell you, you don't have to necessarily use a table, but man, does it make it a lot easier. So that's why I kind of wanted to lean in using that table functionality first, just so that you could uh, understand some of the powers that, that are brought in with this. But for us, we're going to go over here and hit equals unique, and we're going to start to write the formula out. And so we're going to say we're going to use the unique formula. Let's zoom in a little bit more here. Okay, let's use the unique formula. Okay, and then we're going to give it an array. Okay, now the syntax of this is going to be the table name and then the column that we want to use. And whenever we're working with tables, we always use brackets. Uh, and whenever we're working with formulas, we use parentheses. Okay. So um, in this particular case, we're going to open our formula with an open parentheses. We're going to type in the name of our table, in this case, unique data. Okay. Like this, you'll see it highlights the whole thing. We could stop right here if we wanted to, and it would just show us the completely unique rows. But in this instance, we'd end up with the same number of records. But we want to just get a unique listing of our vendors. So we're going to do an open bracket, start typing vendor or select it from the drop down list, close bracket, close parentheses, and there you go. That is just a unique listing of your vendors, which is pretty cool. 
Um, so, you know, if we wanted to get just a unique listing of our accounts, we could do that as well. And we could even combine multiple columns. So if we wanted to get a unique listing of vendors and accounts, we can do that as well, uh, which is pretty cool. So something to keep in mind with respect to how and where you would use uh, dynamic arrays. Okay, so that is using our unique. Let's take a look at sort and filter as well. Okay, so we'll click over here to our sort workbook and we've got a couple of different examples. Um, we got an example set up here. So let's just go ahead and clear this out first and we'll write it. Now I'm gonna point out I have already set up my header row uh, that would not get pulled through with either the unique or the filter or any of these dynamic arrays. It's just data itself. So I've just copied this row up here and now we're gonna go ahead and fill it with data. Now again, we could sort data two different ways. We can come on over here once this table is set up through this drop down menu and choose either the, in this case, filter or sort. So we can either, for example, sort smallest to largest, largest to smallest, sort by color. And then also down here we can filter. And this feature is identical to the data tab, smack dab here in the middle of the filter and sort worker group, okay? But again, notice none of these are formula based. This is something that we would have to go into the ribbon and then click to sort. You know, what happens if I wanna put my data into its separate place? Well, I can do that, and I would do that now using that sort function. Now, the one thing that's a little bit different with respect to um, the sort uh, is that we're gonna reference it by column index, which I find to be a little bit, eh, you know, it's not the way I would personally want to work with it, but it's not showstopper either. Uh, so instead of using the column name here, we're gonna use the column index, which is the column number, column one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Okay, now this particular table name, this is data four. So we're gonna come on over here to our salesperson. We're gonna type in equals data four. You'll see it highlights, the, oh, sorry. Let's write our formula first, equals sort. And we're gonna type in data four. Okay, and we're gonna tell it to sort by something. And so let's say we wanted to sort by the total column. So that is column one, two, three, four, five. So the total column is column number five. Okay, and then the next function argument is going to be the sort order. And so we could put a one for ascending or a negative one for descending. So let's just put it into descending order by total. And there you go. If we look over here to our total row, you'll see in fact that it is now going from largest to smallest. If we change that negative one to a one, you'll see that it is now going from smallest to largest. If we instead wanted to sort by the salesperson's name, we could go ahead and choose sort index one, uh, which is the first column here. And you'll see, in fact, this is now an alpha order by our salesperson. So pretty cool with respect to being able to put things into that specific order. And it leaves our raw data alone. The raw data stays exactly where it has been. And the data is just copied in the correct order of whatever the formula spit is, is written into that new location. Let's take a look at the filter function, okay? Same thing as before, filter is something you can do inside of your data from the data ribbon. You can turn on the filter button and the difference between sort and filter, sort will put things into a specific order, filter will remove things from view. It doesn't delete things, but it removes them from view. So in this particular instance, we got a listing of our salespeople here. And from that, uh, let's say we wanted to be able to pull only salespeople who have a certain dollar amount of sales. And maybe only want to look at, for example, people who have a sales over a million bucks. Well, guess what? We can pull that data into a separate table now pretty easily. So we're going to come over here and we're going to type in the function equals filter. Okay. And in this particular uh, table, this table is named just data. So we're gonna reference the data table. Uh, and thankfully we can reference by column here, which makes it really nice too. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and type the word filter. If I can type here, there we go. And we're gonna tell to filter the data table. Okay, and it's gonna say, cool, you, what do you want me to do? Okay, so like what's, what, what feature uh, columns do you want me to filter by? And so we're gonna say, I want you to filter by the total column. And so we're gonna say filter on the data table, specifically the total column, 
and I only want you to get it where the total column is bigger than a million. Okay, and there you go. That is your data where all sales are larger than a million. Okay, we could combine this with the unique. We could combine this with the sort if, as well. Um, so if we wanted to, you know, kind of build a more complicated uh, extraction, we could do that pretty easily. If we wanted to adjust this and maybe say only show us sales over 1.2 million, well, here are your sales over 1.2 million. Okay, so kind of cool with respect to what you can do with this. Now, we also have the sequence. Uh, the sequence feature will allow us to build a sequence, which can be really useful for, like, let's say, mortgage interest calculator or a compound interest calculator and allows us to build a sequence out for a particular uh, need. So let's say we are building some sort of sequence, okay? Well, the sequence function is going to create, and let's go ahead and write that here just so you can see what it looks like. Uh, and it will create and start a sequence of your choosing. So in this case, we're doing an interest calculator by annum. So we have our payment in period one, payment in 13, 25, 37, 49, so on and so forth, okay? So in this particular case, we're gonna write out equals instead of having to remember like, hey, is it uh, you know month 20, especially after about three years, it can get really complicated remembering every single period. So in this case, let's say I wanna generate uh, a sequence that's gonna last for five years. Okay, so I'm gonna ask it to generate five rows of data and I want it to be one column wide. Okay, you can make a matrix of this. So if you need to make a bigger, smaller, you can really, really simply easily do that as well. And then I want it to start at the number one and then I want it to increment every 12. Okay, and so there you go. Start at period one, go to 13, 25, 37, 49, so on and so forth. If we wanted to create, let's say, a 10-year calculator, well, we change this from generating five rows of data, in this case, out to 10. So now you've created, in this case, 10 periods. It could be as long as you want it. Um, and it'll generate, again, every subsequent row. Now, you could also do this where you're generating columns as well, which is pretty cool. So if you wanted to generate additional columns of data and again, create a matrix in, in a way, you can do that pretty simply as well. All right, the last dynamic array formula, we're going to just go ahead and create a new worksheet here, is going to be the stock history, okay? Now, the stock history allows us to be able to create a, a listing of historical prices of financial instruments, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and create a, a, a little sample up here, and we're going to go ahead and put in, let's just say, our ticker symbol, Okay, and let's just say we wanted to get, um, uh, let's say we wanted to go ahead and get uh, Apple. Okay, so Apple's ticker symbol is, I believe it's either APPL or ALP, I can't remember. Let's see, what is it? Okay. Well, we'll figure it out here real quick because it'll either be right or, or wrong. Okay, AAPL, okay, cool, AAPL, there we go. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna write this formula here in cell A2. We're gonna type in stock history, cool. So stock history is gonna take a stock, in this case we're gonna point it here to A1, and then it's got a couple of different arguments that you could choose the stock uh, start date. So I will point out, you have to pick a date in the past. Um, like if I pick today, for example, well, it's not history. Today is still happening. So we pick a date in the past here. Uh, and then you can optionally choose an end date, what type of interval, it could be daily, weekly, monthly, whether or not to include headers. And then you have up to five parameters you can include, including the open, the close, uh, the market cap, and there's a couple other ones. So in this case, let's just choose A1. We're gonna go ahead and put our, our, our um, date here. Let's just choose yesterday. So in this case, we're recording this on April 22nd. So we'll just choose yesterday. Actually, let's choose uh, April 1st. Okay, and then we'll close this here. And just by default, what we end up with is the date and we end up with the the close. So we can see here Apple on April 1st anyways was on uh, 174.31. Now, if we come back up here to our stock history, we could optionally include a closing 
uh, or a uh, end date on this. And so we'll do another one here. Okay, and let's just choose uh, 12, 31, 2022. Let's take it out to the end of the year. Okay, and if we do that, we get a day-by-day -day history of the Apple stock. Okay, and you'll notice there's some gaps here. So uh, the second, you'll notice we're missing the second and the third. Well, what are those? Well, in this case, it was a weekend. And if there was some sort of national holiday or if the, um, the exchange was closed for some reason, you'll see those dates missing as well. Let's kick this out, for example, and instead of on April 1st, let's choose January 1st. So here is year to date. And if I open this workbook up tomorrow and the next day, you'll see new rows get added. Now, other options that we can choose to include here. Okay, well, we can choose to choose a different interval. By default, it's doing daily. If we wanted to go weekly, here's your weekly price. Okay, if we wanted to go monthly, let's go ahead and do that. So we'll do a two here. Well, here is the monthly price. And we'll leave it here for monthly here for the rest of the example. Okay, we're going to choose to include the header or not the header. So in this case, uh, we'll go ahead and choose to keep the header here. And then we have five optional parameters. The date, the closing price, the open price, the high, the low, and the volume. And so we're just going to go ahead and put in our additional options here by comma separating them like this. And so here is a full example. Let's uh, make them bigger here of what you can get with that stock history type. So if we wanted to choose other stocks, you know, by putting the symbol here in A1, we can easily just kind of swap that out. Um, so if we chose a different company, uh, let's just say, you know, again, kind of going back to some of our other ones that we were considering. So maybe Google, that would be G O O G. Okay. In this case, uh, well, technically it's alphabet, but here you go. If we wanted to do Amazon, it'd be A-M-A-Z, okay? Oh, A-M-Z-N, A-M-Z-N, there you go. Okay, so here's your Amazon price, so on and so forth. But again, if you want to track your historical prices of things, the stock history type in using that dynamic array is a pretty nifty, easy way to be able to do it. All righty, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next feature, which is going to be XLOOKUP. So a lookup formula inside of Excel is something that allows us to be able to take a record of some sort and go to a different worksheet, different list, different table, different something, and be able to return information about that record. OK, uh, lookups, in my opinion, are just a core foundational piece of really any power users repertoire of features and functions. Uh, now, historically, lookup features have been VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP. That's where I think a lot of people feel most comfortable using lookup formulas. But that's not the only way of doing it. Uh, VLOOKUP is great. Biggest issue is it's slow and um you can only look up stuff left of what, I'm sorry, you can only look up stuff right of wherever your index is. Uh, and so one of the biggest issues people find with VLOOKUP is that even though they want to be able to find something, their data isn't flexible enough to allow them to be able to look because what happens if the column you're working with is the fifth, the sixth, the tenth, the five hundredth column? It just, you know, VLOOKUP can only look to the right. So there's another formula, which is index and match, uh, which is one of my preferred ones. And uh, with index and match, it's actually two different formulas. You've got the match function, which will go and find a record and then return the row number relative to the array. Uh, so it'll return a row of like 55. So that record exists on row 55. Okay. Um, and then you use the index function, which will go to a specific row and then return that value. And so it's a, a compound function. It's a function that has two uh, formulas kind of wrapped around each other. But a lot of people struggle because, again, it's a compound formula. Well, so now we have a new formula called XLOOKUP, and XLOOKUP is pretty nifty because it allows us to be able to find things super flexibly. It has the power and flexibility of index and match with the ease of use of the lookup. And with XLOOKUP, you can look in uh, one column for a search term, return data from that same row from another column. 
regardless of which side the data is actually on, which is, again, super flexible. It's also much faster. There's new ways of being able to sort features uh, inside of your workbook. You can start from the bottom and work your way to the top. You can go left to right. You can go right to left. You can go lots of different ways. It also has built-in air handling, too. Uh, there's this feature called Not If, If Not Found, which allows you, for example, to wrap Previously, we would wrap our lookup formula in a if error, you know, so, hey, if you don't find it, instead of showing pound NA, show something else. Well, now we can actually build that error handling directly into the formula itself. So it's really, really compelling with respect to why you might want to consider using this. So I've got a simple example here to show you how to use this formula. So we're in our X lookup worksheet and we're going to go ahead and look up let's say we've got some client information down here and let's say we want to work with uh let's say row uh let's go ahead and say row five here for simone okay and i'm going to highlight row five here just so you can easily keep track of where the data is coming from and we're going to go ahead and clear out these items okay now i've got the formulas written here so you can easily see it and we are working with a table that is just called clients okay so very normally inside of a database, you're not going to get every record you want in the report. Often it'll just have a key. It'll say client five and you won't have the name of the client, the email of the client, so on and so forth. You're going to have to go look up record five somewhere else to a separate worksheet and then pull that data out. Okay. Well, in this case, XLOOKUP is what you're going to want to use. Now, I have my key data here, my ID as the leftmost column, but it doesn't matter where this is. You could move it to the fifth column, the 12th column, the third column. It doesn't really matter. XLOOKUP will find five, and it can go to the left or the right to be able to pull data out. So let's write a couple of examples of some lookup formulas here. And so let's say we wanted to go find our first name. We're going to go ahead and type the formula equals XLOOKUP. And the first thing is what we're going to look up to. In this case, we're going to tell it to look at cell B3. And then we're going to tell it what we would like to look that up to. Okay, And so we're going to specify the table name and column of where to look it up. And then secondarily, we're going to um, tell it what to return back as the second part of this. So we're going to say look up B3. And I want you to go look it up to the client's table, but specifically go look at the ID column. Okay, notice as I'm starting to write these things out, it's highlighting the columns of what it's working with. Okay, and then I want you to go back to that client table, and I want you to go ahead and get me the first name of that user. And if we just hit it here, you'll see it returns back Simone. Okay, now there's some optional parameters that we could choose to use. Okay, our first optional parameter is what if not found. Okay, let me just quickly make this error just so you can see it. Okay, normally inside of a lookup, if we have something that you can't find, it'll say pound and a. That's kind of an unsightly error message. What we can do here is instead, we can say if you can't find it, go ahead and return a different error message instead of pound and a. We can just say not in list. Okay, and now if we have something not in the list, it'll show us a nice message. Or if optionally, we can choose to just do uh, two quote symbols like this, and it can return nothing at all. But if there is a correct message to return, in this case, Simone, we'll see that that will pop back right away. Let's write one more. So we're going to do equals X lookup. We're going to tell to look in uh, cell B3. And we're going to go and look up at the client's table. And from the client's table, we're going to go ahead and look up the ID column. We're going to return back from the client's table. And we're going to go ahead and get the last name. We'll tell it to return nothing if it doesn't find that value. And there you go. So XLOOKUP is really no more difficult, especially if you're using tables, than VLOOKUP, but it has a ton of features and flexibility inside of it. You can do reverse lookups. You can do left to right. I mean, everything that you would normally do inside of a lookup, inside of a normal VLOOKUP or an index and match, you can absolutely do inside of XLOOKUP. Now, the one big drawback limitation of this that I would tell you is that with respect to this, it is, again, a 365 only subscriber feature and especially only newer versions of 365. So one of the issues that I found is even though I can run an XLOOKUP, if I'm sharing a workbook with somebody who's not on a res relatively recent version of 365, when they go to run that formula, it's not going to work for them. But 
XLOOKUP, if you've got it and your whole team has it, man, is it a really effective way of being able to work. Let's go ahead and have another review question. Well, this should be no shock to anybody here. Which tool is the most powerful form of lookup? Is it VLOOKUP? No way. Is it XLOOKUP? No way. Is it index and match? Although that's not listed. Nope. All of those have limitations. Either they're slow, either they can only search to the right of your data. Uh, but you know what? That can do all of them. That's going to go ahead and be your XLOOKUP. That would be the lookup that I would choose to use going forward. Okay, our last feature that we're going to look at in the first part of our class, and we're going to go ahead and take a break, is going to be our Analyze Data feature inside of Excel. And with Analyze Data, what this allows us to be able to do is it allows us to be able to ask questions to our data set. Uh, and instead of having our data set, um, you know, us having to do all the work to manipulate and manage our data, uh, we can have our data talk to us. OK, and so we can ask questions like, hey, what's the top order? How many customers do we have? How many orders were placed inside of the last year? And we can just generally ask good questions and it will respond with an answer. It can also produce high level visual summaries, trends and patterns It can produce pivot tables. And all you really have to do is have your data in a table and be able to click a button and it will just produce that report for you. OK, I'm going to point out, especially for our power users, this is not a tool you're gonna to use if you're really powerful with Excel. You're gonna find that you're always gonna to wanna to create that work yourself. But if you're a new person coming to Excel looking just basically to get your feet wet and just kinda of see what's available to you, you'll probably like this feature. Let's go ahead and take a look. Now what we have here is we're in our, our uh, sample file analyzed data and we've turned our data into a table. And from the home ribbon, on the far right side, you'll see the analysis work group and you'll see analyze data here. Sometimes, uh, well, I shouldn't say sometimes, previous versions, this used to say insights, it used to say ideas, but in the least, the most recent version of Excel, it says analyze data. And we're gonna go ahead and click this. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna pop out a new panel. And what it's gonna do, as long as your active cell was somewhere in that data set, is uh, it's gonna analyze that. It's gonna upload it to Azure, Microsoft's gonna do some AI, uh, stuff inside of it and it's going to produce some different examples of reports that you might choose to use okay so we can see frequency of order amount customer id by order id so on and so forth and right up here at the top we'll see this option that says ask questions to your data and it'll even give you some examples so maybe i want to look at some insights for my order amount and we can see here some sample graphs and charts that will uh, kind of go along with that data. And all we have to do, for example, is click this insert pivot chart and it'll create a new worksheet with that suggested idea, giving us some examples of how this could look. Now, if we come back over here, we can ask other questions to our data as well. Uh, so let's try that one more time. All righty. It's analyzing our data. We can ask it questions. So maybe one of the questions we want to ask here is how many orders were placed? How many orders? You've got to keep your questions simple. I'd really recommend that you don't ask super complicated, uh, ins you know, like insightful questions. But something as simple as this, hey, how many orders we have? Well, we can see here the distinct count of that would be 2,192. And so again, if I click that, it'll create its own little pivot table report. So. Again, I, this is not something I personally use quite often as I personally am, you know, I'd like to think I'm pretty good at Excel at this point in my life. But, you know, I've, I've pointed this out to colleagues who are just maybe not as familiar with some of the options and visualizations and reporting techniques in Excel. And it's a great way for them to get started. Let's go ahead and have our third review question for the first hour of our class. Then we're going to go ahead and take a break and we'll pick it back up. Alrighty, so which of the following are new features inside of Excel? Is it the geography data type? You bet it is. Is it dynamic arrays? You bet it. Is it that analyze data feature? Absolutely. So the correct answer here is going to be all of the above. 
Well, in the first section of our course today, we talked about the data types of geography and stocks. Uh, we took a look at some of the new Excel formulas, including XLOOKUP, stock history. We looked at unique and sort and filter of the dynamic arrays. And we also took a brief look at analyzed data, some of the really compelling ways that we can be able to ask questions to our data if we're not super familiar with respect to how it works. We're going to go ahead and take a break here. And when we come back in the second section of our class, we are going to take a deep dive on collaboration features and functions inside of Excel and 365, as well as Power Query. And I'm also going to show you another really cool feature, which is that flash fill function that you can use. So much more great information coming your way. So please stick with us. Uh, and if you're uh, Hopefully you're going to leave today with a whole bunch of new features and functions and thoughts and processes that you can use inside of this incredible application. Thank you so much for being here, and we're going to go ahead and take a break now. Thank you.